As India signs a free trade agreement with four European nations, is there hope for other FTA negotiations from the UK and EU to Oman, Gulf and Eurasian countries? Do FTAs help increase trade substantially? And are they a challenge to the global economic order under the WTO? Up ahead, we'll also have an excerpt from an interview with the Irish Trade Minister on just what's delaying the India-EU uh, FTA talks as well. But But hello and welcome to Worldview at the Hindu with me, Sohasini Heather. Uh, this week, we're looking at uh, a, a sometimes overlooked part of diplomacy, uh, but it is an important part of foreign policy, and that is trade policy and trade diplomacy. While at present, uh, the Ministry of External Affairs oversees the diplomacy part, while the Ministry of Commerce and Industry actually looks over the trade policy, trade negotiations with other countries, we are seeing officials from both come together more and more for trade talks now, not just in India, uh, but in missions worldwide. In fact, in other countries like the UK, Australia and Canada, departments of foreign affairs and trade are actually being merged and that could be a trend to look forward to in India as well. Now let's start with this week's developments and what happened, a flurry of activities around India's free trade agreement negotiations. Obviously this came just ahead of the announcement of general elections in India. So a stock taking was happening, everyone trying to find out what's happening with their negotiations. One, India signed a trade and economic partnership, TIPA, uh, with a four nation non-European Union, European bloc. So which are those countries? Iceland, Norway, Liechtenstein and Switzerland. Uh, that agreement actually was completed after 21 rounds. It actually began in 2008, but has been suspended between 2013 and 2023. So very significant that for most of this government, the Modi government, the talks were suspended, but when they restarted, they were able to finish uh, quite quickly. And we'll tell you a bit more about why that hesitation in the free trade negotiations earlier. Now, this agreement was unusual. It included a chapter on investment promotion uh, with EFTA countries that promised a commitment of $100 billion in investment over 15 years into India, but with some riders as long as high GDP rates, other economic factors remain. On intellectual property rights, India was able to reject a push for data exclusivity. Remember, IPR is a big part of Western FTAs, but this could have raised the prices of generic pharma in India, so India objected. Uh, this agreement also included a chapter on human rights and sustainable development. It'll be interesting to see if those clauses are invoked at all. Uh, but there's much more of our coverage on the EFTA India uh, TIPA, as it's known, on our website, www.thehindu.com. There's also an interview with a key Swiss minister in charge of the negotiations, Helene Budligar Artieda, so you must read that. Now, the India-UK FTA has made some proce progress, but it is unclear if it can be signed right now before the Indian elections are announced or would it be signed later this year as the UK heads into elections. Now, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak certainly spoke this week to discuss the FTA in particular, talked about the progress, talked about the need to complete those negotiations. Um, the third, Belarus Foreign Minister Sergei Alenik said after talks in Delhi that India and Eurasian Economic Union, EAEU as it's known, is serious about starting FTA talks now. And uh, you can read about that, my colleague Kalol, was uh, covering that. And during a visit to India, Ireland's trade minister, Simon Coveney, said that hopes are high about the India-EU Bilateral Trade and Investment Agreement, BTIA. Uh, and I do apologize for all the acronyms, but listen in as I asked him just what was holding up that agreement. Politics is the straight answer to that question. Uh, look, Ireland wants to see a free trade agreement between the EU and India. Uh, we think it would be hugely beneficial for India for that to happen in terms of trading tariff-free into uh, the largest consumer spend market in the world, which is the EU. Uh, but we also think it would be hugely beneficial for the EU. You know, we, we think this is, uh, this, you know, in the next, certainly in the next decade, India will be at least the third largest economy in the world. It'll be the most populous country in the world indefinitely into the future. Uh, certainly from a trade perspective, we are. Uh, so we're pushing for a trade agreement, but both sides, of course, have defensive as well as offensive interests. Uh, 
Um, Ireland understands the defensive interests that India has in agriculture, for example, because we also have a big agricultural industry and we, we like to protect it in the context of free trade agreements. And that's not easy because we have to find compromise. Um, but I think in truth, what's happening here is, you know, there are elections coming up in India and there are elections coming up in the EU. And when you're in the lead into elections, it's difficult to find compromise positions. And I think that's where we are in truth now. So I hope when there's a new European Commission in place in the late summer, uh, and of course when there's political stability post-elections here in India, uh, I think there will be an opportunity in the autumn of this year, I hope, for the EU and, and India to try to accelerate progress on an FTA between these two giants when it comes to world trade. Irish Trade Minister Simon Coveney speaking to me over there. Now, at present, India has FTAs with about a dozen countries, if you uh, count regions and the countries, most of which were actually signed pre-2014. So there was the India ASEAN FTA. There were also SICAs uh, with Singapore and Malaysia. And if you go to the Commerce Ministry's website, they do have an FAQ. Uh, where you can see what is the difference between an FTA, a free trade agreement, a comprehensive economic uh, uh, and uh, you know agreement, or a comprehensive economic partnership agreement. All of these have different meanings, uh, and they all uh, add up to a lot of alphabet soup. But there's in the India-Japan SIPA as well, um, India-South Korea SIPA. All of these are under review at present. They were all signed before. There's a SAFTA, the South. Asian free trade agreement for all SARC countries. Uh, so, in fact, all SARC countries, including Pakistan, are a part of that. But there are also India's separate FTAs with South Asian countries, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Bhutan. More recently, this is post-2014, the government has signed three FTAs after that big lull, as I told you. One, uh, which would be the fifth, India Mauritius, CECPA, this was implemented in 2021. Then there's the India UAE, which was really much doubted. The United Arab Emirates and India signed one uh, agreement that was implemented in 2022. Uh, then there is more recently the India EFTA FTA, which will be ratified by the European countries and implemented perhaps in 2025. There's also the India-Australia Early Harvest Agreement or ECTA. It's actually not a full-fledged FTA yet. It's still being, they're still negotiating the full-fledged FTA between India and Australia. Besides all of these in the works at present are negotiations with dozens of countries. Uh, the one that have been highlighted the most, so we'll talk about those. One was the Australia one I told you about. SICA was actually due to have been completed by December 2023, so it's missed its deadline by a few months already. Uh, then there was the Canada negotiations for a SIPA, CEPA, suspended by Canada over the Niger killing investigation last year, and that was quite a, a visible break between both countries. Uh, with the UK, the FT has actually nearly been done several times in the past few years, but the rapid changes in UK prime ministers and then India's own election process has seemingly tripped it up. The big question, can they just sign now? With Oman, an FTA is understood to have been finalized, so you can probably expect an announcement soon or if it's put off after the elections. Then there are negotiations with the Gulf Cooperation Council, six nations in the Gulf. These have been delayed for some time, uh, and there's even some consideration that all the Gulf nations could join with the India-UAE FTA if they accept all the terms of that and make that the GCCs as well. And then there's the European Union, uh, which is discussing a bilateral trade and investment agreement. Now, talks were suspended between 2013 and 2022. They're now believed to be in advanced stages. Then there is the Eurasian Economic Union, the EAEU as it's known. It's five post-Soviet states that include Russia and Belarus. And there was that announcement that talks may begin soon on this one. Of course, there is also one with the United States, India's biggest bilateral trading partner in a sense, that was started during the Trump presidency, but it was then dropped by the Biden administration. And the question, could it be picked up if the government in Washington changes? So broadly, where are the stumbling blocks for India's uh, negotiations? Why are so many of these negotiations still being held up? To begin with, there is the Modi government's traditional mistrust of FTAs. Uh, they suspended most of the FTA talks after 2014. They announced they were revising many of the pre-existing agreements, and they actually scrapped all bilateral investment treaties. 
Um, in 2019, India also walked out of the RCEP that it was negotiating, remember, the Regional Comprehensive Economic uh, Partnership. It's 15 nations, including, of course, China, but Asian and Australian, uh, 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 Australia are all part of that FTA. It's a massive FTA, probably the world's biggest right now. India has refused to reconsider its decision to walk out of that FTA, but neighbors like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka have now applied to join the RCEP. So that's worth watching. Uh, another point is India's announcement of the Make in India or the Atman Nirbhar Bharat policy. For many other countries, it seems to run counter to the idea of free trade without subsidies. And so it has held up some of the negotiations or at least created a little bit of hesitation about just where India's priorities on trade uh, opening up are. Uh, India has, of course, always been protective of the agricultural sectors, the small uh, MSME sectors as well. And most FTAs actually leave that subject of agriculture in particular out entirely because it's so difficult to negotiate with India on those. India also, of course, has justifiable concerns about Chinese goods flooding the market via these free trade agreements with third countries. So India now pushes much more for strong rules of origin clauses. They need to know that the goods are coming from that country. A sixth point is the intellectual property rights. We spoke about that a bit. It's increasingly a problem as countries are moving towards research and development as an economic mainstay away from manufacturing. So India is being uh, forced really to accept more and more international patents. Uh, and then there's issues like democratic freedoms, human rights issues, transnational uh, operations. These are all bleeding into negotiations like with the EU uh, for a while with the EFTA and of course with Canada as well where they've completely suspended the talks over them. Uh, Finally, FTAs defeat the purpose of the WTO, the World Trade Organization. They bypass global mechanisms for free trade. So India, of course, that has spoken so much about multilateralism, the importance of global governance, is a little shy of going for FTAs on, with, with absolutely every partner. So a quick question, do the FTAs actually bring in um, any benefits? There is no doubt that trade between two countries increases with FTAs as for three points. One, they reduce or zero out tariffs in most sectors between those two countries. Two, they increase market access for both the parties. Uh, three, they make for reliable supply chains and overall build a positive momentum for trade between those two countries. If you're signing an FTA at the leadership level, it's more likely that businesses in both countries feel a little more comfortable doing business in each other's countries. If you want to quantify those benefits, it's certainly more difficult in the short term, but even so, the Commerce Ministry put figures in Parliament and said this in terms of how India's exports grew from 2011 to 2021. So I'm just going to look at some of the FTAs that the, uh, the Commerce Ministry had put out. If you look at the India ASEAN FTA uh, and include with it agreements with Singapore, Malaysia, an early harvest scheme with Thailand, they went from about 34 billion to about 40 billion. With Japan, they went in that decade uh, from about 5.6 billion to 6.1 billion. With South Korea, uh, 4.6 to 7, so a slightly larger increase. With SAFTA countries, South Asian countries, perhaps you're seeing the biggest shift, and that's because of India's trade with Nepal, Sri Lanka, uh, Bhutan as well. And that went from 13 to 31 billion. So clearly there are all these benefits that we just lifted, uh, listed out for FTAs. And that probably explains the complete turnaround in the government's policies towards negotiation over a decade. So if from 2014 to about 2020, uh, 2021, the government wasn't looking at FTAs, it subsequently has softened its position. So what's worldview's take? Free trade agreements are not just about tariff reductions and about transactional approaches of give and take on market access or IPR. Uh, they are actually an avowment of mutual trust between two countries or the regions as the case may be. In effect, they are a commitment to give each other's businesses uh, and investments near national treatment. So it's a much more philosophical kind of uh, idea there. Protectionism, political differences, therefore, will always be the biggest blocks to the free flow of trade. Uh, and it is necessary, therefore, that India align its trade policy with its domestic and international outlook. Don't let them be out of sync with each other uh, before it rashly enters or leaves free trade agreements, because that, of course, 
uh, puts a cloud over India's credibility when it comes to trade negotiations. Let's get you some reading recommendations. And there are a few actually that deal exactly with the subject. Uh, one book I really recommend is India's Moment. Changing Power Equations Around the World. This is by a, a former Ambassador Mohan Kumar. In fact, all these books are really by uh, diplomats, but Ambassador Mohan Kumar has a really good grip on where India's current positions on a lot of economic issues are. Another book called Free Trade Agreements, India and the World. Another uh, diplomat, Dr. V. S. Seshadri. Uh, and then there's India's Foreign Policy in the, the Post-COVID World. Uh, this is edited by Surinda Kumar. I've spoken about it before, but there's a chapter in there uh, by Rahul Chabra called India's Economic Diplomacy, which is really worth reading. Uh, then there is a more academic book, India's Trade Policy in the 21st Century by Amita Batra. Uh, and finally, a broad economic book of called Journey of a Nation, 75 Years of the Indian Economy. This is by Dr. Sanjay Baru. So we hope you find all of these links very useful and join us again here on Worldview from the team. Thanks for watching.